Thanks, Leah, and thanks for the invite to be able to provide some local context in terms of KT uh, at uh, the Manitoba level. What I want to do today as, um, although my day job is <clears throat> at the Richardson Center for Functional Foods, I also chair the board for the Manitoba AgriHealth Research Network. And I want to give you a little bit of background of the story of how it was created, who it looks after, and particularly how it uh, translates knowledge all the way through from scientists to the user community and particularly uh, to producers. So I thought I'd start with this as an overview slide, and I'm sorry if you can't, um, if, it's, if it's not that clear, but really it is all about um, partnerships. The Manitoba AgriHealth Research Network is basically um, anchored with the growers and producers. These are the farmers that are actually out there right now, or were at least uh, till last night. My 18-year-old uh, is farming right now. He came in at 6 in the morning because they had to get the, uh, the seeds in before the rain started today because of insurance deadlines at the end of this weekend. So it's a pretty amazing group, and uh, I'm learning more and more about just what uh, part of the equation they are. The grower groups are extremely important as well in that they handle the checkoffs uh, from the farmers and then they push those back into contributing to research in important ways. MAFRD is our, ag is our agriculture department in Manitoba. They provide the insight direction and they actually provide a lot of the support to enable MARN. And then these three centers are the infrastructure that um, do some of the heavy lifting around the research. So I'm going to talk about the um, uh, CCARM group at St. Boniface, my own center, the Richardson Center, Food Development Center. I want to talk about the critical Manitoba companies that engage with MARN and form that important part of the partnership. And then the um, as well as University of Manitoba entities such as the de uh, other departments, the Asper Center, and, uh, and right out to innovative retailers. So it really does take a village to build a healthy functional food, in this case a, a pita shown here. So basically a couple of words about Manitoba first since we're, a lot of you are visitors. So we have a population of 1.3 million. Uh, it's a great place to live. Once you're outside of the perimeter, I know people won't believe this, but folks actually wave to you as you drive by on the gravel roads, which might seem a little amazing uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, it's, um, it's huge, the size of uh, California, and, uh, and it has a uh, GDP, which is actually third best in Canada right now. So um, we're actually one of the have provinces as opposed to have not right now. Even though we don't have potash, we certainly do have agriculture. And it's also, if you orient the globe in the right way, you can put Manitoba right in the middle of everything, as you see here. So it's strategically, it actually looks pretty good. It's the middle of everywhere, I love to call it. So strategic transport links, um, R&D credits, there are a lot of reasons why companies come here, and it has a knowledgeable, skilled workforce. So it's a good place to do business, and ag is really a key business here. So it employs about one out of 10 people, uh, very diverse commodities with some new things too, the hemp, uh, barley, uh, hemp industry is actually just uh, accelerating. Uh, added value jobs, 23% of total manufacturing output is food processing. So really ag rocks in this part of the world. And for that reason, it's really important to have this entity that's called the Manitoba AgriHealth Research Network. And you can see what it does up here. It basically supports these kinds of things, research, development, commercialization. Uh, both of grown and processed plant and animal bioactives, a focus being around foods and bioactives from those foods. And you can see communication, facilitation, brokerage, and coordination. So it really deals with that continuum across all those stakeholders I showed in the first slide. And basically the um, key competencies and key targets are testing and assessment of plant and animal-based bioactives. So through production, uh, we do a lot of this uh, in, in the centers I'll describe in a moment, the clinical proof of safety and efficacy, effectiveness, product development, and commercialization right through to um, really what then draws back um, to the producer, to the farmer, 
adding value to the commodities they produce, giving them choices as to what they're going to plant uh, in the ground. Um, it also provides <clears throat> health and wellness at a, at a global, local level. Uh, for sure, rural economic development is stimulated through this and adding value to the farm gate. So it becomes, MARN actually assists in the commercialization pipeline from R&D right through, and I want to give you some specifics. And we then build partnerships. It's really around that. So it's really around the public-private partnerships, leveraging on existing infrastructure, and really, um, I guess the main strength, the main pillar of activity is around the functional food nutraceutical piece uh, that we're all so familiar with here, and really still has this amazing annual growth trajectory. So right through the recession of 2008, the functional food nutraceutical market continued to grow at double-digit growth, and it does. It is a great space to actually be playing in. So let's talk about the infrastructure that MARN uh, leverages, and uh, there are really three key uh, institutions that uh, MARN works around. So uh, the Canadian Centre for Agri-Food Research in Medicine at St. Boniface, the Richardson Centre and the Food Development Centre exist as the key um, competencies. So uh, the CCARM is actually very close um, to us just uh, downtown across the river. Uh, it's affiliated with St. Boniface Hospital. And really, um, it looks at efficacy safety issues, normally in patients with more existing disease than with risk markers. It's affiliated with a very strong teaching hospital, so it's got more of a bench to bedside platform. And it really uh, involves researchers from academia, from the medical community, uh, working with those patient groups. The Food Development Center out in Portage, which just um, profited from a multi-million dollar expansion, is, um, is more aligned to uh, product uh, scale-up, development, packaging, uh, branding. So they work more with small uh, and medium uh, employers, SMEs, and, uh, and work with them to get their product actually properly commercialized. So they're more on the commercial side than the, than the academic side. And then the Richardson Center, um, where I work, it actually engages both partners in almost an equal footing. So we really are industry focused. In fact, we just had a group this morning, a tour from China, uh, with a view towards signing up to do some uh, some, I think, very important research in developing an omega-3 egg platform for this group. So we have uh, tours almost every week, and we're uh, able to engage partnerships. We really work around um, a platform that I call 4Ds. So the first one is discovery research, which is really the NSERC CIHR basic um, entity research. The, the second D is development. So we're interested in developing functional foods that actually can be commercialized. The third D is discussion. That's really the KT part, and that is getting our message out there. And the fourth D is devouring. It's really important that the food tastes right, and we're all over energetic in putting all this goodness into these foods that wind up tasting um, worse than the box that they're actually housed in. So we have to be careful about making sure the hedonics, the sensory, uh, are right. So we like to think of ourselves as going from the farm gate to the dinner plate uh, and a few steps in between. In terms of the MARN competencies, as a platform, um, we're quite diverse. So I mentioned the many um, commodities. So we take raw materials from a whole variety of different sources here. These are focused on the prairies, although not exclusively. In fact, MARN partners work worldwide, as I'll comment later on. But then we uh, superimpose the expertise, and we have tremendous expertise here in this region. Uh, lipid metabolism, cardiovascular disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes. Researchers cover the broad gamut. It's um, across the academic units and across the various centers affiliated with MARN. 
And then that basically uh, evolves in the production of real food products. I'm going to show you some of these uh, in a moment. And I guess the tie back here is the really critical part. This is a cyclical thing. So by developing food products that, get, that produce that pull, what we're doing is effectively pulling up the commodity prices. We're seeing this with hemp tremendously right now. We see it with a lot of other sectors as well that are a little more established. So let me just give you some examples um, of the kinds of things we do. We've really been very interested in pulses, and I take my hat off to Pulse Canada for investment in the PIP program, which a number of us in the room here uh, were funded through five, eight years ago. That has culminated in a tremendous, I think, um, body of science, which has then engendered and enabled companies to go take those products right down to Cheerios protein uh, now is has a Cheerios with pulse protein in it. Protein seems to be one of the big touchstone entities right now in functional foods. Uh, we're working hard through MARN with our various partners to build proteins that can be added to uh, things like yogurts and we have some um, major activities going on to build the right protein that can be added to the right type of food uh, material. So that's one. Uh, we're also blending those kinds of proteins uh, together with other entities to create smoothie mixes, which really have great hedonic appeal, which are very healthy, and which are resonating uh, in terms of the earlier discussion this morning with that environmental friendliness, that 100-mile diet concept, which really seems to be getting a lot of traction right now. Uh, we're also working together with CCARM and other centers to test the efficacy of pulses um, in terms of a their anti-diabetic action. So blood sugar control, insulin levels. Uh, our group's been very much involved with uh, Chris Marinangeli's work uh, and subsequently now looking at pulses and exercise and the impact, and many of us have, have uh, been examining that area within the MARN sphere and, and beyond. Specifically, pinto beans are an area of uh, considerable interest, getting that right balance of amino acids uh, with buckwheat to get the methionine cysteine ratios right to give you that adequate protein without needing the animal base. And then, of course, lots of other good things that particularly for advancing age are what you want to really have in your diet. So, in fact, we've moved the pinto bean flour product right down to a true health marketable product I'm going to speak on a little bit later on, um, and some extru extrusion uh, techniques. So partnering not just the commodity group uh, with the nutrition, but food science to get something that actually looks like uh, pretty much like a cheesy, it might could do with a little bit more orange color, but it tastes pretty good. We had them last night at the scientific uh, Cafe Scientifique, and they were that bowl was completely emptied. So that's a good sign. The less left in the bowl, the better the uptake. So people like these at the uh, test we had last night. Uh, we're also ex exploiting the fact that canola oil is one of the fastest growing um, oil options right now globally, and uh, uh, Marn has been instrumental in creating this virgin uh, cold press canola oil. So it's got lots of other bioactives in it. Uh, stability is a challenge, but uh, right now this is actually drawing a lot of attention and, uh, and interest. We moved to buckwheat, so we've been creating buckwheat snacks, barley chips, um, full of beta-glucan. We're fortunate to have Dr. Nancy Ames and her team. They actually were successful in obtaining a Canada Health claim for beta-glucan from barley. And we've developed some really yummy foods along those lines. We go right into meat products as well. So you saw pork was important in Manitoba. And so um, we've actually been looking at some uh, flour substitutions uh, to eliminate some of the need for meat. Again, more environmentally friendly. We've been working with soy to create some delicious soy spreads, uh, which have the attributes of uh, soy. <clears throat> Carrots, to look at carrot powder. Not all carrots fit in the carrot package, so the ones that are a little too long or a little too short can be ground up, and instead of the waste uh, you heard about earlier today, we can actually do something useful and then marble them back into foods, and this is one of the MARN 
projects and this yummy one with uh, some of the berries that we have in the prairie region here too. These decadent frozen desserts are another initiative that the partnerships between companies and um, uh, researchers have uh, allowed. So let me just um, show you another aspect, I think, of an innovative model uh, generated through MARN, uh, which has uh, enabled us to go even further. So MARN was established in 2007, and in 2009, we created what's called a MARN Inc. That is, it's an incorporated subset of actually seven companies uh, that were able to then uh, operate with better freedom in terms of bringing in companies, bringing in researchers, and, uh, and other stakeholders to enable that translation of knowledge to occur. So it, let me just give you a couple of examples. First one of these is New Eats. This is incorporated, and it's actually a way of us, if you will, pressure testing some of the products that we've been working on with this SMEs and other industries. So, here, a group of students. This is basically a micro-commercialization of new ideas. We get them out there in the university or other places. Uh, we have uh, the right coolers and freezers and showcases. Here's the forks, which some of you probably will visit or have visited in Winnipeg. So the market down there, here's some of the products that we have out. It really gives us a chance to see how, uh, what the receptivity is before one goes for full-scale uh, commercialization. These functional food inks have also been um, successful, seven of them, uh, organized around different commodity groups. So what they are, they're basically to characterize, produce, and market bioactive infractions from Manitoba grown and processed crops. They involve companies, growers, and the Marn cluster, and academics to assist in guidance. And, uh, and they've actually been pretty successful. The Pinto bean one here has seen companies link in like Best Cooking Pulses together with researchers and actually generate those Pinto puffs you saw. So you can actually put some money metrics around it. It can operate as a non-for-profit, but you can flow the cash in and out of it in a way that uh, allows um, a seamless venture through. And I just give you another example here. This is the uh, Saskatoon berry biorefining. So all the way through here from utilizing from the dried fruit through to the fruit leather, through to juice powders, juices, and um, even seed oils over here. These can all be managed and um, better manipulated through the use of a Marn ink. Also want to talk about another um, innovative partnership which has led to, I think, a pretty neat outcome, which is uh, True Health Therapeutics. So this is actually step one foods out of Minnesota. And uh, it's a um, dose nutritional therapy. We're building some of the Manitoba foods into this. So it's um, in conjunction with the Mayo Clinic. So Dr. Carla Taylor's lab, my lab, and the Mayo Clinic are actually testing these in individuals pre -pre with prediabetes and individuals who are statin intolerant. So we're taking Manitoba foods, adding them to this, uh, repertoire of foods that have already been developed. The platform here is that these are, it's, it's like the portfolio uh, dietary pattern developed out of uh, David Jenkins' group, but these are really yummy, yummy foods. Uh, they taste great and they've got uh, enhanced levels of fiber, phytosterols, antioxidants, and omega-3s. And so we're testing them for efficacy right now in a trial uh, and the foods have flown, have flowed out of the Marn uh, Association. Lastly, connecting with the broader community. Uh, again, as mentioned earlier, Manitoba uh, is um, certainly uh, eager to um, engage in global outreach, and we have successfully. So we have had several uh, successful initiatives with South America, Santiago, Chile, with Europe, and, uh, and have set up MOUs with uh, folks at the Beijing Vegetable Research Institute, University of Maastricht. So um, we've really tried to bring Manitoba into the global frontage. And this one, the last I'll mention, is the uh, Canadian Climate Advantage Diet. So uh, this is endorsing and supporting the benefits, not just health, but also economic and locally produced aspect uh, to generate a portfolio of products which are Manitoba grown, uh, processed, and the health 
attributes identified through the MARN partnerships, through our ability to do the clinical testing for safety and efficacy. They're both based on crop and animal products, and we have actually just conducted an economic healthcare cost saving um, analysis and, uh, and anticipate that just in Manitoba alone we can realize a 19, um, sorry, that is Canadian, $19 billion annual uh, cost care saving by embracing some of these uh, Canadian climate advantage foods in our diet. So here's an example. Uh, you can see here these are gluten-free products of uh, whole wheat bean flour over here and uh, prairie original cookies with um, various pulse and other products on the left-hand side. So again, these are prototypes and uh, we're hoping that with the right partnerships we can bring them into mainstream uh, Canadian, the mainstream Canadian food system. So I'm going to summarize there uh, just to say that basically the Manitoba Ag Health Research Network works in a uh, duality mode. It both plays a key role in coordinating and showcasing Manitoba's role in functional foods and extracted bioactives by getting out there and uh, advertising all the good things we do in Manitoba. And it also is used to work the other way in bringing in uh, opportunities for us. So the MARN partners and collaborators bring together comprehensive capacities and skill sets to enable efficacy and safety testing as well as marketing of food-based bioactives uh, really by working together with uh, external partners to make it work. So with that, I will stop and uh, these are some of the links if you want to learn more about MARN uh, and happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. Well, we, you know, we, it is a triangle, I guess, between the, uh, we're very fortunate to have producer groups here that, uh, that actively engage researchers and companies to, uh, to really allow for that uh, forward movement. So that between Pulse Canada and the Canola Council of Canada, we now have um, the barley groups and uh, the um, many commodity groups were able to almost reshape foods and their design uh, by allowing the research to happen to take us into you know a better health realm. Um, if you take a look, I was marveling at some of the the, the the slides from this morning's presentation. Probably sometime in the nineteen. 50s or 60s when everything was white. We had white bread and white rice and white pasta. I mean, our diet became so incredibly bland. Uh, I remember in fact on Ed Sullivan they had a spaghetti tree if anybody remembers that. And for, on April Fools it was a, it was a, um, sh a tree showing how they make spaghetti in, uh, uh, in Italy and of course people believed it because we were so naive. Back then, you know, the, the guy who um, brought up Boston Pizza, who's on uh, Dragon's Den, uh, he said he was a cop in BC and he went in the 50s or 60s to a small community in BC and wow, they sold pizzas there. That was completely new. So our diet, we have to realize 50 years ago, was so white and so bland that we're gradually building it back to actually probably what our ancestors had 10,000 years ago, full of all the good things like fiber and phytosterols and omega-3s and lutein and lycopene. And, and, and so we're helping the food industry by almost redrafting, probably reinventing uh, where we were a long time ago. So it's through the public and private partnerships that we're able to do that. Um, and so far it's, it's, I think it's been very, it's been pretty successful with MARN.
Peter, I really admire what you're doing and what you've done out here, and I can tell you you're better off you didn't accept that job in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I was ever offered it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but on the food health agenda, and I think this fits in with some of Leah's intent this morning, I'll give you an example. You know, I'm now executive director of Child Center for Nutrition, Health and Development. And we're relying on a lot of rich benefactors in Ontario. So David and John just self submitted and got accepted study on canola, meta-analysis versus carbohydrate. And we all know canola is a healthy oil. Well, one of our very wealthy potential benefactors read, and she's one of the 30 million out there that know more than we do, but she said, I can't contribute to the center because, you know, these two people have accepted money from the Canola Council and Agri Innovation. So, and you know, I, I, we're in the innovation to some extent too, and we're in the, the third largest food cluster in North America. But there's such a horrible suspicion between the faculty, some medical thinking and the food system which I think is really ironic, they embrace the drug system. And it's like this whole debate on soy, soy, uh, soy salt. Um, you know, the drug industry here protects us and saves our lives and the food industry kills us. That's the challenge we have to deal with. You seem to be able to embrace the companies and the small, even the smaller companies to help them for the economy of the province. But then the issue is, and I'd probably question your $19 billion, million dollar <laughs> benef <laughs> benefit, you know, but I mean, you have to use that to sell. It's a long way trying to get around um, that environment in that health system. And I suspect you've still got it here in your medical system, even though you got research involved, but it's back to them trying to get more as Leah's doing education in the medical curriculum and the health professionals so they understand the need for what you're doing. And that's not so much a, qu a question, but it's an observation. So I hope you don't isolate yourself from that dimension. No, I think it all ties back to the truth in research. It ties back to the peer-reviewed publications that come out of the activities we do. And, and that's the anchor point. So work like yours on, um, with the PIP project uh, that your lab with Rebecca Mollard and others have done. I think that's where where we start. And, and that is an impetus for all stakeholders to say, we need to make a change. I guess what I'm trying to find out is, so, so now we've got a dialogue going between David and Tom and this rich person. <laughs> I'm going to contribute to the center because yeah. uh, I'm trying to explain to her and communicate, and I think it's this, this talk. This, long scientist. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're 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 trying to listen, as we were told this morning, but uh, it's almost like you need for someone like that to show them. I don't know what it is because the website she's using is not one we would use. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, almost if you had a piece of paper or maybe a spokesperson that. There wasn't, uh, yeah. but it's... No, it's a substantial hurdle that we face is, is trying to get through the self-acclaimed expertise and positioning on this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.